This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. This Week in Virology, this is a special episode recorded on April 20th, 2015. Hey everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIV, the podcast all about viruses. I have a special episode for you today. It's all about clams. So get your beers and hot sauce. (laughs) I'm right here in the TWIV studio with my colleague who is a professor here at Columbia in the biochemistry department. He's also a member of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Steve Goff. Welcome back. Hi, everyone. Glad to be here. Steve was last with us a long time ago. We're in the 300s now. You're on TWIV 76. I don't know if you remember what we talked about. I think it was an XMRV day. Yeah, it was. Probably. (laughs) It was XMRV. (laughs) And that story has gone. Although you have two people in your lab who worked on XMRV, and in fact, one of them is sitting right here. He is a postdoctoral fellow in Steve Goff's lab, Michael Metzger. Welcome. Thanks for having me on. So where are you from, Michael? Uh, Well, (laughs) depends on how far back you go. Um, (laughs) You're not an endogenous retroviral. No. Uh, <laughs> let's see. So I, I was actually um, born and grew up in Phoenix, Arizona, so ah. about as far from clams as you could get uh, in the uh-huh. desert suburbs. Uh-huh. And then I went to uh, Cornell for undergrad. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Yeah. I went there as well. Yes. Uh, when did you graduate? I graduated in 2002. So I so. graduated in 74. <laughs> so... Yeah, we didn't cross. So uh, I had, for genetics, Jerry Fink. Jerry Fink. You know that name? Yes, I do. Steve knows who he is, right? Oh, yeah. Sure. Famous guy. Right. Can you believe now. me? He taught me genetics. Monday, Wednesday, Friday, 8 o'clock in the morning. Yeast, <laughs> yeast genetics at the time? Probably. All kinds. All kinds. We yeah. had labs, of course, associated with it. Sorry to diverge, but you know, that's how. Um, we had um, a whole bunch of different labs. We had a Drosophila lab, but we did have a yeast lab where we isolated oxytroph, and he, and he wanted all the histidine oxytrophs. And that is the mutants that needed histidine for growth, because he was studying the histidine biosynthetic pathway. Right. Isn't that cool? So he figured I might as well get something out of these uh, laboratory exercises. All right, That's Michael, great. I'm sorry to interrupt. Ah, so you went there, to Cornell. There are never any digressions. On what, did you, <laughs> what did you major in at Cornell? Uh, so I majored in uh, biochemistry and did a double major in uh, philosophy as well, just because that... Cool. It was something I could do at the time. So. Well, you know, Harold, Harold Varmus was a literature major, right? Really? Yeah. I didn't know. That's okay. Uh, and so I actually, I, I didn't work during the year when I was in uh, Cornell, but I did do two summer uh, research stints at uh, the Mayo Clinic uh-huh. uh, in a branch in Scottsdale with uh, Jamie and Nancy Lee's lab. Who, and, who at the Mayo did you work with? It was a uh, doctor, uh, well, I worked in the, the Lee lab Okay. With uh, Michael Borchers, who was a postdoc then, who now has his own lab at uh, University of Cincinnati. Got it. And so Got it was it. in mouse models of asthma using, a, a mm. looking at the role of eosinophils. So they were the ones who sort of taught me how to hold the pipette and that mm-hmm. sort of basic stuff. And ended up uh, getting involved in going from knowing nothing to having uh, the chance to actually design a couple small mm. experiments and things. So that mm. was my first experience in lab work. Okay. And after college, you what, you decided to do a PhD? Uh, actually, it didn't go directly. So I didn't have too much experience in viruses through undergrad, but I knew I was interested in them. So mm-hmm. I wanted to um, be a tech uh, in the virus field. So uh-huh. I worked for uh, Preston Marks for mm-hmm. two years as a technician at the Tulane Primate Center, um, doing a lot of uh, phylogenetic work uh, and working closely with uh, Krishna Petri mm-hmm. there, who is uh, now... Um, at University of Pittsburgh. Mm-hmm. Um, so doing a lot of sequencing of SIVs and uh, unknown viruses. It ended up finding some pretty cool um, findings about the origin of uh, the transfer of uh, SIV uh, Sudi Mangabe, mm-hmm. uh, which we've talked about before as, as the origin of HIV-2. Yeah. It also was the origin for um, the SIV macaque, which is the SIV that's used as, as a, a model um, and so, hmm. so found you out. did that for two years. Yeah, so I did that nice. for two years. Uh, and then jumped to uh, Seattle, so mm-hmm. the University of Washington, to do graduate school. 
With Dusty uh, Miller. Right? Yeah, that was with Dusty Miller. Right. And he'd done a, a whole lot of work uh, on retroviral gene therapy and, and adeno-associated virus gene therapy. Right. He'd done some of the the, uh, the work there. And that was a place where he could do a lot of different projects. And as you mentioned before, I ended up doing some XMRV work there. Because mm. uh, we were there when XMRV was just sort of being identified. And it was initially uh, associated... So we... we uh, in collaboration with uh, Munish Tawari's group at the Hutch, uh, mm. found that it was present in this 22 RV1 cell line that you right. talked about. Right. Uh, so that actually was sort of a a funny story how that was identified. The grad student who was working on that project, uh, uh, Emily Knopf, uh, she was working on uh, in Munish uh, Tawari's lab, mm. working on prostate cancer and the role of exosomes. And so they were purifying all these exosomes and trying to figure out what was in them. Uh, <laughs> and on her committee was Michael Emmerman. And when she, at one point, as the story goes, <laughs> she uh, showed an electron microscopy image of these exosomes that this prostate <laughs> cancer cell line were produce, being produced. And he uh, raised his hand and said, those are retroviruses. Uh, that's great. And so... Uh, <laughs> And then since uh, Dusty's lab had done a lot of work with MLVs, they came yeah. to us and we uh, sort of, sort of uh, did some southerns and characterized the, yeah, yeah. the XMRV that was in that cell line. That was a prostate cell line, right? Yeah, that was the prostate cell line. So I remember that paper, and that was the first indication that this virus was maybe not where it was supposed to be. I mean, it was a good virus. It was interesting. It was in a yeah, human yeah, cell yeah. line. You worked on it for a we while. We did, yeah. and it was. In a, it's actually a very hot virus. It grows grows, grows really well. well. Yeah. But yeah, it uh, wasn't in humans in reality, and it was yeah. uh, contaminating DNA work that led people to get excited about it, and then you know, finally going into chronic fatigue, which was out there. Yeah, it contaminated an awful lot of things. Mm -hmm. um, so you have someone else in the lab, another postdoc, who worked with John Coffin on that, right? Right, and that's oh yeah, same guys, and she was right. instrumental in figuring out really what XMRV was and mm. where it came from. Well, if in your mm. case, you got two good postdocs out of XMRV, <laughs> right? <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. So then, um, what was your real? That wasn't your main project, right? Uh, that was sort of a, a side project yeah. that uh, became interesting. My real project, or my main project, was looking at. Uh, uh, ways to target gene therapy. Mm. There have been a lot of problems in gene therapy in terms of uh, integration into uh, insertional mutagenesis caused right. by integration. Right. Uh, and so there's the idea that you could uh, have targeted DNA repair through double strand breaks, which mm -hmm. was sort of new at the time, um, but now with a lot of these CRISPR tools that you've talked about. Yeah, uh, it's it's more common. So I was looking at uh, instead of using a double strand break uh, to induce the DNA damage. Uh, so if you use a double strand break, the majority of those breaks are repaired mutagenically. So you end right. up having frame shifts or or right. insertions, deletions. You can also repair those breaks with a homolo with a template, and so you can. Mm. Um, actually make changes and using homologous recombination to repair uh, in a specific way. But that's not mm. the most, the, the, the dominant route of repair in mammalian cells. Uh, so I was trying to show that using a, a targeted single strand NIC, you could induce the homologous recombination without causing the mutagenic right. breaks of double right. strand breaks. Mm. And so I was working with uh, Barry Stoddard there who is doing a lot of the work with uh, homing endonucleases. And a, a grad student in his lab had just uh, designed a homing endonuclease that normally causes double-strand breaks, and they designed a mutant that makes only a single-strand mm -hmm. break. So I could compare the, them side-by-side mm -hmm. side in a very directed manner. And uh, using plasmids as well as a adeno-associated virus vector system. Right. Cool. How did you end up in Steve's lab? Uh, so I ended up in Steve's lab. Uh, well, I'd got a... Uh, when I started looking for postdocs. Yeah. Um, you wanted to continue in retroviruses? I wanted to continue in retroviruses and in other related things. Uh, there was another project that I'd wanted to work on that I'm still sort of working on as well, but um, that, uh, and I wanted to look at sort of the evolutionary biology and some of these restriction factors, and, mm. and also um, I'd gotten a lot of 
recommendations that Steve's lab would be a great place to be, and it is. Was there any particular thing that he published that you saw and you wanted to go work there? It was just his general reputation? Uh, it was just um, a combination of the two, because yeah. there had been a general reputation and a long history of uh, uh, being a, a place where people can yeah. uh, get a lot of training and where there's a lot of really uh, interesting work that's being done and where people... There's also a little bit of independence and different things going on in the lab. It, it's sure. uh, something where you can, like this project, sort of carry a strange idea that sounds <laughs> interesting and, <laughs> and end up in, in interesting places. So I think... Yeah. I think I remember Michael applying and it was, you know, he's coming from Dusty, great lab. Yeah. And I said, oh, this is, this is good, good yeah. guy. And he's got training that you, it's good for you. You, you exactly. probably sometimes get people in totally different fields, right? right. Um, so how long have you been here now? I've been here just a little over three years. Okay. So you've been in Tucson, you've been in Seattle, New York? Um, so yeah, Tucson, so right? Phoenix. Phoenix, same, yeah. same thing, right? Ah, <laughs> <laughs> big differences. Which is your favorite? Um... I I think Seattle is probably yeah. my favorite. I would have guessed you were from Seattle, actually. I've been there for a while. Because you so. could have stayed there and worked with Mike Emmerman, right? He's right. Retrovirus. Well, I, I uh, uh, actually did a rotation with Mike Emmerman, yeah. um, so I figured I'd go a little bit further than down the hall yeah, yeah. for postdoc. But that wouldn't have been bad, right? That wouldn't have been we, bad. We it's got a, him some really great work there. Yeah, we did a twiv with him, mm -hmm. of course, and also with Harmeet Malik yes. out there as well. Good stuff. Good place, right? Yeah. Well, so the reason we're doing this TWIV is because you just published uh, a paper in Cell. It's made a little bit of a splash. I know this work has been going on a while because I've heard about it here. Um, but it's called Horizontal Transmission of Clonal Cancer Cells Causes Leukemia in Soft Shell Clams. I want to talk about this, but I want to learn how you, Steve Goff, got involved with... <laughs> clams because I've known you as a marine leukemia virus and HIV lab for all these years. Abelson even, right? Right, right. All these mammalian retroviruses. But this is not a mammalian system at all. Right. Can we you tell us the history? We we didn't expect to be here, probably. <laughs> um, but it's been a, a fun trip. It started really with a with an email from Carol Reinish mm. and One Carol co authors it, on this paper. Indeed. Right? Yeah. And she is a marine biologist card-carrying marine biologist at Woods Hole, um, really just retired, just retiring now from mm. Woods Hole. But um, in 2009, I think it was, we got an email, and she told me the story, which I knew nothing about, that there was a leukemia in her organism that she'd been working on mm -hmm. 20 years. Uh, it, and this leukemia was widespread up and down the the coast, North Atlantic coast. Mm -hmm. um, and it was, a, it's her, her the organism is a clam, right? Yeah. Yeah. This is Maya arenaria, soft shell clam. I love huh. soft shell clams. I love to eat yeah, them. Many people do. Yeah. <laughs> They're good. Um, so so this, I was intrigued. This is what she has studied her whole career. Her whole career. Oh, okay. Right. And she was led to contact us by a mutual friend of yours and mine. And that's Ann Gifford. Mm. <laughs> so Ann Gifford was a scientist at, working when I when we were postdocs at MIT in David yeah. Baltimore's lab. Right. And she got assigned to work with me. She was terrific. Right. Right. And I remember. She did a lot of southern blots <laughs> of the <laughs> Abelson gene in our day. Um, so years later, she's a she's a friend of Carol Reinish's. Yeah. And Carol asked her out of the blue, look, I'm thinking this disease of my organism might be caused by a retrovirus. And yeah. if it is, who should we talk to? And Anne, knowing us, put her in touch with us. Said, "Well, why don't you call Steve Goff? Mm -hmm. He'll he he's, cool. works on them. You'll <laughs> you'll get directed as to what to do." Huh. Um, so she knew this was a leukemia in the clam. Is that correct? It is. She she definitely likes to call it that. I think it's controversial in the field what to call it. It's known to be a disease where there's an enormous hyperplasia mm -hmm. of cells. It looks like a leukemia. So in the, the clams, in clams, there is uh, some some fluid. What's it called? Hemolymph, right? Right. So that you know, they don't have what we would think of, I guess, as blood okay. exactly, but they have hemolymph, and they have circulatory cells. Mm -hmm. They're they sort of on a slide look more like macrophages. They're adherent 
um, but they perform a lot of the same functions. So what are they called, hemocytes, Hemocytes, right? indeed. And this, is, this is the main cell in this hemolymph, right? right? But the, there was always a question of whether the tumor cells were truly derived from those or whether they might have come from another organ. Mm. Uh, of course, they're so transformed, it's hard to tell. So these are not solid tumors, right, but, right. but they're, like leukemias, they're, right? They really are like a so leukemia. So the, the, uh, the hemocytes are just proliferating? Mm -hmm. Are they abnormal-looking or...? They are. I mean, yeah. they're rounded. They are not adherent anymore. Mm -hmm. um, the the they're incredibly high mitotic index, so they're they're rapidly dividing. They they fill the whole fluid to the point where they mm -hmm. infiltrate all the organs, and the animals die. And do they die of infections or just? Well, we don't know because we, we can't know. talk to them. So I don't know how they you know, <laughs> feel, but I I think it's probably organ failure from this enormous expansion of these cells. Okay. And so this disease has been going on for many years? Yes, yes, over, really over 20 time. years. It's the northeastern seaboard of the U.S. mainly, right. nowhere this, else? The species is pretty much originally oh, it's located here. only found there. Um, you don't find them in California, for example? No, they've been transplanted to the Pacific coast uh, um, by human you know, right. intervention, but normally they, their natural habitat is just here. So they do grow out there in the Pacific because mm. of the transplant, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. They've, they've colonized out there. Yeah, that think uh, people think that that colonization was done actually in the late 1800s, uh -huh. uh, sort of accidentally when people were transporting uh, oysters out there. Uh -huh. But it's sort of an odd case that it's they're sort of technically invasive and in that we brought them mm -hmm. there, but they aren't proliferating or destroying the ecosystem or anything. So yeah. there's not a whole lot of research. There's, no one's trying to stop the invasive species because they're not that invasive right, and right. they're not natural so people aren't really looking at them in that case so there hasn't been a whole lot of, of, of work on the Pacific Coast population. So what's the um, lifespan of a soft shell clam? Was it a year yeah, or longer two? Longer than you might think. They 10, 20 years. 10 or, really? Yeah, they live pretty long. Because most, most of them don't live that long because we eat them, right? <laughs> right. But they're grown in beds, I presume. They, they grow in the mud, yeah, in tidal flats of, you know, un, under under the mud surface a foot or two. So it's at the shoreline, more yep. or less, right? Tidal. People right. go and scoop them out. But when commercial fishermen, they, they do the same thing? They just scoop them out randomly? They don't have any particular beds that they go to all the time? Uh, I think they generally will sort of seed an yeah, area with, seed them, uh, okay. with the young clams, about mm -hmm. a year old, uh, I believe. And then just if you're doing a larger scale commercial one, maybe you'll dredge up the area or you'll just pick them out by okay. hand at low tide yeah but they're mostly dug by hand even today so when you harvest the clam for eating how old is it typically a couple Might be years. five or ten years wow i mean they're they're you know they can be uh an inch i forget there are probably rules on how big they have to be yeah. to be legally collected but they're you know one three inches wow i didn't know they were so old i'm gonna feel bad about eating <laughs> a five-year-old clam now I, I can't eat lobster because big lobsters are old, too. They're really old, right? I feel they bad. 20, 30 years old. Like these huge ones, they're yeah. ancient. It's like cutting down a sequoia tree. But what's actually believed to be the oldest animal that's been recorded is actually a, a type of quahog, I believe. Uh -huh. uh, uh -huh. And that was based on counting, sort of counting the shell yeah. layers, sort of counting like, uh, like counting uh, tree rings. It was 504 or 509 years that they wow. think it was. Mm -hmm. So some of these other species of bivalves can live extremely long periods of time. So how old uh, are the clams when they acquire this, where they develop this leukemia? We'll call yeah, it. There, there, was a, there were a couple papers, papers saying that there might be uh, an age when they're most sensitive. Mm. Um, and I think it was a few years. I can't, it was two, yeah, three, I, four years. I think they're mostly in the, the two to five ra year range is when okay. people think they're most susceptible to the disease. Uh, based on uh, yeah t transmission experiments. So have this has this disease had an impact on commercial fishermen? Yeah, it's in, definitely in certain areas. Mm. It's serious. I mean, there are there are harbors that have been closed because yeah. essentially the harvests just go to zero as the wow. animals are wiped out. So uh, New Bedford, a lot of Chesapeake Bay, you know, a lot of areas mm. are. It's very uh, you know specific to geographic areas. Okay. A lot of them are, are impacted seriously. Of course, that's not the only issue that they have uh, as a species, yeah, but it's yeah, one sure. of the problems. I know you told me this a couple of years ago. I had no clue that <laughs> soft-shell clams were dying, right? All right, so you got in touch, or Carol got in touch with you, 
And what'd she do next? Send you well, a bushel of clams? Well, she told us about it. And, <laughs> and uh, you know, her thought was, well, you know, this is something where there was evidence that it was transmissible already. Ah, uh, okay. um, Because it was spreading? That, that, because it was spreading yeah. locally. And there were experiments that you could transmit it mm-hmm. in various ways experimentally. So the question in her mind was, could this be a virus? Did she try and transmit it in the lab, like grow these clams in a tank and show you could go from one tank to yeah, another? that had been done. You could inject um, Hemocele- cells from, from cells. one to another. And there was there were even reports that you can just put them in the tank, mm-hmm. and not all reproducible. Okay, um, but okay. there were hints that that might be true. Got it. But there was certainly no firm, strong nailing down of any agent that might be responsible. Right. So the fact that it seemed to be transmissible, she thought it might be a virus, and that's where right. you came in, yeah. right? So oh. we said, well, we can do something easy. We can just look at least and see if there's reverse transcriptase, for example. Because you figured it would be, since might. it's causing cancer, it would be a retrovirus. Might be. I, I think there had been a, a, at least one or two groups who had shown that reverse transcriptase activity in the clam was found in some of the tissues of those clams. Right. The diseased animals. Yes. Right. Right. Okay. But not so, the not the healthy ones. Is that did they do that at all? Yeah, yeah I mean that. The, yeah. They, these were you know reports, kind of single single reports. Yeah, not, yeah sure. Not often followed up but so there were there were hints that this might be going on okay so we went and looked and you know we we when you say look did she send you stuff she did yeah and both uh hemolymph from diseased animals uh-huh. and cells that we could culture but not clams so, at this point she said clams right away not right away uh anyway. not full clams just uh i believe that was initially just the hemocytes and the hemolymph okay samples so we said, okay, well, we'll look for reverse transcriptase, just mm-hmm. the way we would look in, you know, infected mouse cells and infected mm-hmm. cultures. Um, you know how we do this because you know you've been through it. We mm-hmm. assay for activity on templates, um, asking whether RT would incorporate triphosphates. You take an RNA template and a primer, right? Yep. yep. And so we did that, and to our surprise or delight, uh, in fact, that activity. The, the samples were very hot. For reverse transcriptase. Now, this was started, you weren't here at the time, is that correct? Right, this was started by uh, Gloria Arigata, who's right. a previous postdoc in the lab. From Chile, right? Right, right. I remember her, yeah. So we managed to persuade <laughs> her to be a victim in, in the lab and try this crazy project. So she was working she on was something willing. else? Yeah. And you said you want to work on clams, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's great. So, well, would you do this at least simple <laughs> thing? And then it worked, and then she got hooked. So the reverse transcriptase activity was found in diseased clams. Did you have controls, healthy controls? At sure. The time? Yep. And they were negative? They were negative, right. Wow. So we were intrigued. You must have been amazed at yeah. that, right? Yeah. We said, well, this is good. Okay. This is interesting. So actually, the next step then we thought was, well, you know, um, to figure out more of what would, could possibly be going on, we are going to need to clone whatever might be the virus right. or the source of this. And at the time, it was really just becoming possible to do deep sequencing. Mm. Um, and we thought that would be the way to go. Um, and that raises issues of funding. Yeah. Um, and Ian Lipkin, who was here, um, was at the time doing a lot of deep sequencing mm. of lots of odd sources where there might be a virus. And we went to him and said, well, you're in the business. This is perfect. Um, and he said, sure, we can do this. So we prepared RNA um, from these from these diseased he, tissues. She, and okay. she Gloria looked, um, ultimately, I think what we ended up sending Ian were preps that were uh, extracellular mm-hmm. um, and maybe even pelleted. Um, so you, our, where you would think there'd be virus particles. Where there might be virus particles. But you right. didn't look for any at the time, right? You didn't do any EM or we anything? We had not yet tried EM, yeah. and we figured, well, that was going to be difficult. EM is always tough yeah. if you don't have something that's really incredibly right. active. Right. Um, so we set off RNA, prepared, you know, mildly prepared as if it was possibly a virus mm-hmm. to Ian. He did deep sequencing of it. Um, and we got back the sequences, and we just looked for whether there was anything homologous to Maloney virus, basically, right. the mouse leukemia virus we work with. And the simple answer was there was. Um, there was a, there were a number of reads um, that were really quite homologous to Maloney. What, any particular part, or RT or GAG? They, they were GAG and, and Paul and uh-huh. RT and Integrase, yep. Wow. So we said, okay, this is hmm. good. Um, that gave us enough sequences to look now back at the DNA. Yeah. Um, and so Gloria was essentially able to walk using those sequences 
and recover longer and longer contigs that were, uh, in the end, uh, an element we named steamer. And this is from the clam genome. At, it is. Right? It is. Right. Steamer. That's a great. Did you think of that? <laughs> yeah, we made it up. It I love was, it. It was good. I'd like to call this episode Steamer. <laughs> Would that be good? <laughs> You know, we named it after the popular name for the animal. Yeah. These are steamer clams. It's, there's also some tradition in the in the retro element uh-huh. field to name uh, after yes. things that jump or hop or move. Just you give know. us some of those names. They're really cool. So there's there's Kanga and right. Roo. Yeah, there's there's <laughs> Skippy. I think there's an Odysseus. Um, there's Gypsy. Gypsy, there's, I remember. You know those. So there's a Sleeping Beauty, right? Yeah, yeah, and that's a that's, that's one that doesn't move. That wakes up actually. <laughs> it wakes up. That was, that was one that they actually resurrected from. They resurrected the consensus sequence that was functional from mm. multiple uh, sequences that mm. were mm. not functional. What's the origin of Sleeping Beauty? Is that Drosophila? I should remember. I can't. I look it up. Look it up. Do it. <laughs> Sleeping Beauty. Um, transposon, right? That'll do it. Yeah, it's um, from. Yeah, if you do Sleeping Beauty, of course you'll. Yeah. It says here it's human, but um, you think that might be right? Uh, this genome of vertebrate animals. No. Okay. So it's 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 not a Drosophila. Okay, Sleeping Beauty. <laughs> um, so you at the time was the clam genome sequence? Was this the first sequence? Not really. Getting? In fact, it's not. It's still not published. Mm. Um, it's being annotated. We we have access okay. to it, right? Michael, you weren't here at the time that this started, right? Right, I wasn't here. I uh, I think it had just been sort of named Steamer, and then yeah. uh, uh, Gloria had gotten the um, gag and the Paul genes and found them in in uh, the clam when I got here. Right. And then one of the things that was the first thing we noticed is that we could never find any envelope sequence. All right, so, so these were proviral sequences, presumably, yes. right, in the clam genome. Right, so yes. as she well, was walking and, and getting the full sequence, basically, right. one of the things we realized pretty soon was that there were nice LTRs. Okay, you saw so LTRs this, at so both the, ends. So we knew right. we finally had the whole element when we basically walked out okay. and ran into the two LTRs. And you had GAG and RT, but no envelope. Right. Right. Okay. So now the next thing that was exciting was that this element was present in the genome of the clams that we were collecting, healthy clams, at small numbers, you know, two, mm-hmm. to, two to ten, somewhere in that range. Two um, to ten copies per genome. Per DNA copies per genome. That's not right? a lot, right? Which is eh, kind of normal. I yeah. mean, you know, for a, uh, really, that's mm-hmm. a relatively small family uh, for an endogenous retro element. And the expression levels in most healthy clams was low. But in the diseased, it was often sky high. So many of the diseased animals had huge levels of transcription going on. And when we looked at mm-hmm. the DNA, they had huge copy numbers How many? of DNA. So a typical tumor that was really um, you know, massive would be 150 copies would be a good yeah. number. Yeah, there were 150 up to 300 was the highest. Wow. And actually, very, we didn't really see anything that was in between. Mm. Interesting. And was, these were um, these copies were local, or were they spread all over the genome? Uh, so we haven't looked at since we don't have a, a, a full genome of the whole yeah. clam. We don't know exactly where they are. Uh, but by southern blots of you know digest and what you can tell from that would suggest they're scattered. They're, okay. they're probably integrated all over the place. Yeah. And so the idea, your idea was, was that this may be causing the, the tumor? And I, I think that's still uh, very, very likely, that there, had, there was some kind of enormous expansion. This thing was activated somehow. Yeah. We're getting a lot of RNA, a lot of reverse transcription, and then mm-hmm. reintegration all over the place. That's, that's got to be a horrible thing <laughs> for the genome. So it's, be, uh-huh. it's being mutagenic, basically, by inserting in so many places. Right, right. right. And at this case, at mm. that point, we still were thinking that it might be amplifying these copies within each individual animal, because that was our first mm. hypothesis that right. at, that in each animal that this tum- this cancer was being caused by the amplification of the retrotransposon, mm-hmm. um, and that was sort of the standard model that we were thinking of. But and that's the point when we started uh, looking at integration sites, because we knew that even. If you looked in the tissues, you didn't see that high amplification. You didn't see that mm-hmm. high copy number. Uh, so it looked like the 
high copy number of integration sites was acquired only in the tumor cells and not right. in the rest of the clam. So, so, so in a clam with with a leukemia, if you look in normal tissue, you, you wouldn't see that, right? right. Uh, you, you can see a, a small number of copies. Uh, it's h slightly higher than background, just, and we think that that's largely due to uh, infiltration yeah. of some of the tumor yeah. cells within the, the okay. tissues, but mm -hmm. overall it, it's much less, and it's not anywhere near the level that you see in the cancer cells themselves. Yeah, so that made sense, and it would, you'd say, okay, well, maybe as this thing is amplifying, you know, in each animal, you're going to get an integration the equivalent in in the mouse system with the mouse leukemia viruses is that mm -hmm. you'd integrate next to mic yeah or some other oncogene do clams have oncogenes presumably they, they do they, they do. do they have p53 indeed yeah. rb mm -hmm. they have all these things okay. so so this would make sense <laughs> so that would mean we to to know yeah. what's causing the the cancers we'd need to get the integration sites let me just ask you a few things that are all popping into my head for i mean you you said there was a an activation and that f is followed by the integration and the oncogenesis. We don't know what caused the activation, right? right? Mm -hmm. No clue. No. Yeah. And, I mean, and just a true. random turning on in retrotransposition. And, and as we're going to end up saying, we now believe that expansion happened long in the past. Yeah. And that it's not happening in every clan yeah, yeah. that gets disease. So um, you said there are transcripts made, right? Are there proteins made from the RNA? Uh, we don't have antibodies, so we don't know. Um, but I would guess... Um, Any time there's a lot of expression, but you had RT likely. activity, so right. it must right. be. Yeah, we had RT right. activity. Yep. So, but you told me once that you do not see viral particles in these cells. We've right? we've looked um, casually, I guess I would say, but yeah. we haven't seen it. If they're present at a low rate, it can be very difficult to definitively yeah. say that we do see particles. If, if we look in uh, supernatant of cells that ha that are these tumors, neoplastic cells, if you look really sensitively using qPCR you can detect uh, mm -hmm. steamer uh, RNA but you can also detect some RNA from cellular genes so it's it's hard yeah, to know sure. if there is a very low level of these particles being produced it, it's hard to be certain about that so you could have even without envelope you can have particles because gag alone is enough right. to make particles right, right. Uh, the gag would make the intracellular particle so this looks more like um, a LTR retrotransposon rather than a retro virus so the the gag is much smaller mm -hmm. um but there could be uh yeah it could still theoretically be making particles and if there's some sort of other packaging mechanism involved in the cell uh some other yeah. something else functioning as an envelope it, yeah there's all sorts of so, uh, so that was my other question are there other endogenous retroviral elements in the clam genome besides steamer I, I would bet yes, but we don't really know much. Because you don't have the whole genome yet. Right, That's right. the problem. It's yeah, we don't know of any others. Would you be surprised if there were, were just this one? Is that, does that happen, that there's just a single retro? Uh, I think most most genomes that we look at um, yeah. have multiple families. Yeah. And certainly, you know, vertebrates sure do. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think it's likely, but we'll know when we get yeah. the sequence. And I'm sure they're going to have lots of the uh, non-LTR uh, retro elements like similar to lines and signs. I think those are going to be pretty common throughout their mm -hmm. genome as well. Mm -hmm. When you look at the phylogeny or the tree of similarity to steamer, some of the other close friends in other species are things like TY3 in yeast, yep. uh, copia in drosophila, and most of those hop intracellularly. Um, but even copia and some of the others have the potential for transmission at low efficiencies even though none of these have envelopes. So how would a single or t one to two copies of a of steamer, how would that, what's the mechanism for its amplification? What happens? Normally you would activate transcription, right. make a lot of RNA, encode the particle proteins, mm -hmm. trigger a reverse transcription in the cytoplasm, and then reintegration of those DNAs. Okay, so the DNA would just reintegrate randomly. Yep, at random okay. sites all over the genome. Yeah. So you and I had a little, uh, Michael had an offline conversation uh, yeah. about uh, retro, endogenous retroviruses versus retro elements, mm -hmm. right? So this, you think, is a retro element because you don't see any viruses or you don't have any evidence, right? Right, and when you take the, uh, the Gag and Paul genes and uh, make, do a phylogenetic analysis uh, with the other retrotransposons and mm -hmm. retroviruses, it fits pretty far outside of the retrovirus tree in with the retrotransposons, which are the... Okay. Uh, it's a, essentially a, a more diverse... The whole retrotranspos... Or the whole vertebrate retrovirus tree fits sort of within the retrotransposon tree if you look at the reverse transcriptase and integrase genes. 
Uh, so and, and this looks like it belongs firmly within the LTR retro transpose on clade. Some of the okay. other similar, okay. like Steve said, some of the other similar uh, sequences are the TY3 retro transpose right. on in that. So you told me that common thinking or current thinking is that the retro elements, either LTR or non-LTR, actually predate retroviruses, right? Right. Is that, yeah. And yeah. that's a that's a school of thought that, that yeah. they evolve first. Yeah. And then the acquisition of envelope mm-hmm. protein on a, an envelope gene was the sort of enabling event that allowed viruses to become much more efficient at spreading right. horizontally. Right. Because then you get the envelope and you can get out of the cell and right. infect another cell. Cells, right. So if you take this steamer, have you cloned this now in a plasmid, the steamer? Mm-hmm. I presume so, right? Yes. Um, if you put that in a mammalian cell, does it do anything? Uh, <laughs> I haven't gotten it to do anything there, but it, um, there's a lot of potential problems there. Uh, You've tried, though. Right? Yeah, I've, I've tried a simple experiment, okay. but uh, there's definitely more you can go. There's always more you can go back and, and yeah, test okay. there. okay. So is this where you move into the story now, Michael? Yeah, I, I came in when we had the sequence and we were looking at a phylogenetic analysis. Mm-hmm. Um, and then uh, I, so, uh, see, Gloria had done the uh, QRT-PCR showing the activation, uh, the mm-hmm. expression, uh, and had, had done a Southern showing that the DNA copy number was increased. So I, right. I looked at the, uh, sort of quantifying the DNA copy number in the samples we got mm-hmm. from uh, Prince Edward Island and also in a, in a new set of samples from Maine just to see that this is happening in two mm-hmm. different populations that are independent. Uh, and so then, as I, as I said before, we were thinking at the time that these amplifications occurred within each animal. Uh, so I started looking at integration sites with the idea that if they are happening in each animal, every single animal would have a different set of integration sites. Uh, but when I did this uh, inverse PCR method and, and isolated or cloned and identified some of the integration sites, when I would look for the presence of those specific integration sites in other animals, I would find that the integration sites I found in one cancer and one animal were present in every other animal (laughs) that I was finding, which was really not what was supposed to happen. Um, How does this inverse PCR work? So the inverse PCR is a way, so normal PCR, you have to know two sequences. Right. Uh, you have a primer on either end, and you amplify what's between them. Right. When you want to do, uh, when you want to look at integration sites, you have to, you know what's in the middle, and you want to amplify what's on the outside. Outside, right. Uh, and so there's <laughs> a couple different tricks to do that, and they all basically involve digesting the DNA, and then ligating something onto that DNA, uh, and so that you can. Prime back to prime the viral back. genome. Okay. So you can prime yeah. out from what you know and yeah. prime back from the cut site that you made. Yeah. Uh, the inverse PCR is a way where you actually digest the DNA and ligate it into circles. Uh, mm-hmm. And then you amplify out. And you am- and that way you can actually amplify, uh, if you use the right enzymes, both the upstream and the downstream integration site of the same right. integration site at once. I think that was also used for... XMRV integration site analysis. Right? Yeah, I think they've, they've done prostates. a lot of that. And, and there's a lot of done with the ligation-mediated yeah. methods there. So you found that the integration sites were identical in different clams from different places, right? Yeah, and even clams from different places. Um, so did you think first that it must be all contaminated? Uh, <laughs> there was still... So, I mean, there, that's definitely a concern. That's definitely you know, something you have to worry about. Story, yeah. Right? <laughs> I was trying to be very careful. I'd been through the XMRV thing. You want to make yeah. sure that there's no contamination. Yeah. Um, but, yeah, they made sure that that uh, it wasn't contaminated. Mm-hmm. And uh, also each of these individual samples, you can mm-hmm. see some slight polymorphisms in them. And so I, we were pretty sure that it was not contamination right. with that. So there were some nucleotide differences, but... The integration sites were the same. Yeah, and they were the same to the exact base pair, which Mm. is pretty uh, unexpected. Now, there are... So one of the... At this point, there were only essentially two theories that we could think of that could explain this, and both of them were kind of crazy. Uh, And the first was that this could be a very site-specific integration Mm. mechanism, Mm -hmm. uh, because there are some uh, retrotransposons, like the TY3 itself... um, that can integrate in a very site-specific manner. But that had only really been seen in yeast. Um, and even then, 
it wasn't exactly the same level of specificity that we were getting. Uh, and so then our other alternative hypothesis was uh, what we ended up finding, that th these aren't actually de novo primary tumors occurring within each animal. It's actually a clonal cancer cell line that is transferring from animal to animal, mm. uh, similar to what had been seen before uh, with the two other natural cases of this sort of uh, cancer transmission, the Tasmanian devil facial tumor disease mm -hmm. and the canine transmissible venereal tumor. And those were the only other two examples of this kind of thing happening before. And those are those uh, associated with retro elements? Um, actually, uh, one of the first markers that uh, the first pieces of genetic evidence that the uh, canine tumor was definitively a, a contagious tumor cell line uh, was a line element that mm -hmm. was in front of Mick that was found mm -hmm. in all mm -hmm. the different tumors. <laughs> wow. So the idea is that at some point in time, a tumor cell arose, develops into a tumor, but that, those cells can tr transmit to other animals. In the case of the dogs or the Tasmanian devils, they're transmitted. So people have shown that they're clonal. Yeah. Right? Yes. Yeah. Right. And, and the, the Tasmanian devil one is is known was known to be transmitted by biting. Right. The animals essentially, you know, bite yeah, yeah. and start the tumor growing in another another animal. And the dog's yeah. tumor is transmitted sexually. Sexually. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So what else did you do to to make sure that this was right? You did some other... Right. So at, at first, we'd just seen those integration sites. Uh, so we want to look at other markers. And the first thing that we do, which is actually probably the easiest thing to do, was to look at uh, mitochondrial DNA sequence, since there are mm -hmm. primers available that can amplify a lot of mitochondrial DNA sequence. So we amplified that from um, all the different tumors that we had found from... Uh, uh, the Canadian samples, as well as the ones from Maine mm -hmm. uh, and and one from New York, and additionally looked at the sequences that were found in the uh, non-diseased tissue of each animal as well, and found that there were polymorphisms that were different between the host tissue and the cancer, <laughs> uh, and that those polymorphisms were present in all the different cancers. So we have right. the single SNP. There's one unique SNP that is present in uh, every single cancer mm -hmm. cell that we've seen so far, and we've never seen it in any normal animal. Um, and then, so that's just, that's mitochondrial DNA. We also looked at uh, uh, the chromosomal DNA using microsatellite mm -hmm. uh, uh, polymorphic markers. What's, what's a microsatellite? So microsatellite repeats are basically uh, usually dinucleotide repeats, just like a stretch of GC, 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 or... AT or like hundreds of these over, and uh, over. not necessarily hundreds. They generally the ones that are used go on for on the order of twenty base pairs to a hundred base pairs, and they're scattered throughout. And the they're sort of scattered throughout the genome. Okay. And the the characteristic of these is that they mutate rather rapidly. So every there are many different polymorphisms within populations. So different individuals will have different ones. And these are actually what's used in a lot of uh, forensic analysis okay. and paternity analysis because these are markers that are very variable. So you'll have, you know, GGGGDA, GGGDA, and something like that that's unique to you and somebody else doesn't have. Right? Um, yeah, actually one of the major ways they do it by, is by expansion and contraction. So, that, huh. so you'll actually put a primer on the flanking sequence. So you put primers flanking this variable repeat. Oh, and see. then in me, that amplification, or that amplicon would be 100 base pairs, and in someone else, it could be expanded up to 200. And so you right. basically, you see one or two, depending on whether you're homozygous or heterozygous, but you see different sized alleles. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then you can map those. And the nice thing is they're so polymorphic that everybody's different from Amazing. everybody else. Yeah. So you and I would be totally different. You, all you have to do is look at a few dozen markers and, okay. and you'd be and tight. and how many microsatellite loci are there many? uh many so it just depends on how many you go through the trouble of characterizing yeah. and fortunately for us um uh two different groups had already looked at uh, soft shell clams uh, for <laughs> ecological studies and we had had designed uh primers for several of these polymorphic loci uh that we could use in this experiment. And they'd used it for looking at the ecological diversity across the, the seaboard, but we could use the same yeah. uh, primers to show that there was a difference between the tissue and the cancers of these animals. Uh, so, so the cancers were all had the same 
kinds of microsatellites in terms of the ones you looked at, and they were right. different from the tissues. Yeah, they were all extremely different from the tissues, and they were all very similar to each other. There actually were some slight polymorphic differences. Mm. Um, in, uh, in particular, between the Prince Edward Island group and the New York group. If, you, if we look on a tree made from these microsatellite repeats, um, mm -hmm. you can see that those two groups cluster very closely together, but there are some differences. In it. So it looks like there has been uh, some evolution that's occurred uh, after the original origin of the cancer and, and where it's diverged in those two different populations. So we think there has been some divergence. We really don't have any idea how much time that represents um, and how long they've, those two populations yeah. of the tumor yeah. have been separate. Hmm. But you can see that there are some small changes. You would expect that to happen normally, right. so that's okay. So we sort of hope by looking more deeply at that, we'll actually get a sense of the time, yeah. how long mm -hmm. this tumor's been spreading and, and how, how long it's been around. You said, you, you said in your paper... Well, the disease has been around since the 70s. So right. this tumor, is it's got to have happened at least then, but possibly before, right? Who knows? Possibly. Although we, technically we don't have samples from the 70s. We know that the disease has looked like this since the 70s, and we have samples yeah. from the last couple of years. So, um, hmm. but, we, but we think that it's most likely the same one that's been going on. But it could be going on for a couple of years, or it could be for a couple of centuries. We yeah. really don't know the time scale. Yeah, so in your paper you say that the transmissible tumor arose of um, of dogs ten to thirteen thousand years ago. Yeah, that's wow. pretty <laughs> pretty spectacular. Um, mm -hmm. And yeah, those those two uh, other transmissible cancers are pretty different in that. So the Tasmanian devil tumor is believed to be only about twenty five years old; it yeah, never been yeah. seen before that. But yeah, contrast that with the canine transmissible venereal tumor, which they think is about eleven thousand years old. Hmm. So it's so we're we're probably our, somewhere our, in the middle yeah, there. Yeah. Our, our range, range is in the middle there. there. Yeah. I guess it, do the do the clams on the west coast develop this uh, disease? Do you know? I I don't know if it's been studied carefully on the west coast to see if mm. there is. Uh, the disease isn't really visible unless you look at the hemolymph itself. So mm. it's yeah, yeah. it might not be obvious unless someone's yeah. specifically uh, checking clams okay. for this. So what's the theory of how this arose? Tell us your summary. Well, I mean, we think that maybe uh, the induction of steamer was the trigger. Yeah. We don't know that. Mm. Um, and that this hop would then cause somewhere in the, in the genome uh, a mutation that's maybe dominant, mm. um, like the activation of NIC that happens in our virus in mice. Um, and that triggered the tumor to grow. It may um, somehow learn to spread. It may have acquired uh, the ability to spread. Um, it's that in itself is pretty interesting. We'd like to know what it needs to do to colonize a new animal. We'd right. love to know how it gets out, right? Gets into seawater, <laughs> and how it gets into another animal. So it has to survive. Right. The cell we're talking about a cell, right? right. Getting out of the clam into the seawater and getting into another clam, right? Seems like a low probability <laughs> event, right? <laughs> right. Well, but then these, so in the other two cases, it is physical contact that's transmitting it. Um, mm. But these clams are separate from each other. They don't, right. they definitely don't fight. Um, <laughs> and, uh, but they do filter feed and they filter a large yeah. amount of seawater. Yeah. So if we get any of these cells, our theory now is that if we get any of these cells free floating in the water column, then that would be taken up by the next climb over and it would be mm -hmm. uh, able to engraft then. But yeah, like, like Steve said, we'd be very interested in figuring out what are the mutations that enable it to sort of jump and engraft into the next animal, and that'd be very interesting. So um, is anyone planning to take cells from a diseased animal and actually put them in and show that they can transmit the tumor? Yes, and that, that's been done, and Michael's doing it. You're doing that? You can, um, do, you can transfer the disease with just cells, right? Yeah, and that actually been sh that has been it's shown, shown before. before. I think people didn't realize how close that was to what was actually yeah. happening in, in the wild. So people had shown that you can transfer disease by uh, essentially transplanting the tumors from one to the other. Um, one, one experiment Michael's trying, which was very exciting to me, is actually trying to induce steamer 
uh, expression yeah. in a healthy clam mm-hmm. and seeing if that will initiate a whole new tumor. This will be a distinct tumor from the one right, right. that's so, circulating. Yeah, essentially a new primary cancer How lineage. How do you induce steamer? Uh, so there have been some reports that you can induce it with uh, BRDU, which is a bromodeoxyuridine, mm-hmm. a, a drug that's been shown to induce the expression of uh, endogenous retro uh, elements in mice. Um, and people had mm. shown that this could also uh, induce, if you inject this into clams, it will induce a leukemia-like disease in, in the clams. Uh, and so we want to basically uh, do that experiment and, and look to see what are the whether the steamer retrotransposon is being amplified in those right. uh, clams uh, when you add the BRDU and whether the mutagenic or the insertional mutagenesis caused by those steamer integrations could be driving oncogenesis. So you're growing these hemocytes in the laboratory, I presume. Is that right? Um, so I'm growing clams in the laboratory. <laughs> really? In tanks? I don't have any in the, at, at the moment, but mm-hmm. yes, yeah, so we've had uh, we uh-huh. have clams in tanks in the fridge. Uh, uh-huh. It's actually difficult to grow the cells themselves. That's something I'm also. <laughs> working on trying to get a, a better system for proliferating the cells because we don't have a, a way to actually amplify the cells in tissue culture at the moment. Hmm. So the hope would be to find an integration site that correlates with right. induction of cancer and then see the gene involved and hope to learn something mechanistically. Right. That's or, definitely one of the things we're actively looking at right now is looking at the integration sites. And it could, or it could be one of the known oncogenes, right? Mm. Yep. Don't right. Know. There might be two events. I mean, there might be an oncogenic event first. Mm. Yeah that would give you a tumor in one animal, and that may be something else equivalent to a metastasis gene. Right. Uh, we have so, no way to know. I mean, one of the interesting issues, I think these these animal tumors, the dog and the Tasmanian devil you mentioned in your paper, they have down-regulated MHC. They and do. That's why the cells are not rejected by someone else, another animal, right? right? Right, So if I gave my cells to you, they would be rejected because we're incompatible. It's a whole thing about immunosuppressing people when they get transplants. So right. Why so MHC down regulation explains the transmissible dog in Tasmanian. What about the clam? Do they have MHC? They do not have MHC at all. Uh, so the MHC is only in uh, jawed vertebrates. So anything. Yep. No jaw and clams. <laughs> no. Right. Yeah. So, so, ha- so they don't have an adaptive immune system as we know it, at least. So normally you could you could transfer cells among these uh, animals without a problem, right? Uh, so we don't, yeah, presumably. That's, that's yeah, the idea. that hasn't been explicitly tested, to uh-huh. my knowledge. But they do survive, so they must have, they have something. They have to be able um, to defend themselves in right. some way, right? Huh, interesting. And, and indeed, the hemocytes are said to have the yeah, ability yeah. To, to essentially prevent bacteria and, and other pathogens from getting into them. Right. So we, what's, what would be very interesting is to know what level of innate immunity yeah, they yeah. have. Right. Um, well, something might be defective, right? That didn't get so. This this may be a very rare event. This this initial development of the oncogenic clone, and maybe it's accompanied by something else that allows it to proliferate in a in another animal. Right. And there's also evidence that there are some populations that are more resistant to it than others. Yeah. In the history of people studying it, they've seen uh, outbreaks that would wipe out an area, but then other times you see it maintained at mm. a low level of about one percent incidence. And so there could be other genetic resistance uh, in some populations and not others. Right. You mentioned that there are other transmissible neoplasias of bivalves, clams, oysters, mussels, cockles. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, we don't actually know if they're transmissible in most cases, but there are other leukemias. Yeah. Um, so a lot of species have leukemias. Hmm. And we're, we're curious to know, indeed, are they all or many of them yeah. attributable to their own transmissible clones? So if you got a... Right. Transpose on in a muscle. What would you call it? You can't call it steamer. Right? <laughs> yeah, we've we've thought. I've thought a little about that. <laughs> we have we have some time to think about names. I guess. <laughs> uh, cool. Um, but yeah, we do think it's possible that uh, the, some of these other diseases and other clams could be due to a similar type yeah. of disease. And in that case, it could be cross species transmission, or it could be a de novo new lineage of cancer in each species. So this could be a more common phenomenon in. Uh, bivalves or even invertebrates than mm-hmm. people previously recognized. You don't know if this steamer can go into, the tumor can go into other bivalves, right? No, we haven't tested that. Mm. Yep. 
Now that's that would be very exciting if we saw this very clone in another species. But yeah. Yeah, we're, so you're we're planning looking. to look? Yeah, definitely. So you're collecting uh, bivalves. Huh? We can't say that this tumor is from a steam uh, soft shell clam. So you can or you can't? We can. Yes, yes. yes. So it's got it, the right sequences and right. all that, right? Yeah. But it would be interesting to find it. You could definitely distinguish it in a mussel or a quahog or whatever, right? right? Yeah, wow, that's pretty cool. So uh, what... The press has really jumped on this, right? <laughs> Why are they so interested in this? I guess they like the novelty. They like the idea that transmissible. Was, huh? Yeah, I mean, you know, in the, when the Tasmanian devil and the dog yeah, tumors that, were discovered, I think there was a similar, you know, kind of wow factor. Um, yeah, a transmissible tumor is unusual. It's pretty mm -hmm. rare, so I guess this would. So I guess they ask you if people can acquire <laughs> this tumor by eating clams, right? Always. <laughs> what, always do you ask. what do you tell them? Say no, not happening, right? Why not? Because we definitely would reject it. I mean, we, mm. you know, we certainly believe we would reject even human tumors right. of each other. We're, we're definitely going to not have a problem with it. Of clam. course, if someone were <laughs> severely immunosuppressed, they might not reject it, right? I just think if you eat a, uh, a clam. The likelihood that the cell is going to survive in your stomach is yeah, that's minimal. not very likely. And then, uh, well, you could imagine it getting in into you know openings <laughs> in there, but still, it's not going to survive, and it would likely be rejected. I know years ago, people were injected with HeLa cells, mm -hmm. you know, right under the skin, and they did form little tumors, uh, and then, but then they and went then away. They were rejected. They presumably. were rejected. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, there were rare. There was a case of surgeons worrying about this, right? Getting cut or yeah, getting yeah, a, sure. getting a tumor. There was, yeah, there was one case of a surgeon getting a tumor from a patient that after cutting really? uh, his hand. Was the surgeon immunosuppressed? Uh, I don't think the surgeon was immunosuppressed, but I think the tumor was removed and the surgeon was fine. Um, huh. And uh, yeah, I think we count on our immune systems to take care of these kinds of things, and they and it probably does. And there are cases of uh, people being immunosuppressed. So organ transplants have their occasional cases where you. People who receive the transplant and who are immunosuppressed because of the transplant yeah, will get yeah. tumors from the the donor. Hmm. Right. So it's it's it certainly could happen when you don't have an immune system yeah. that right. protects you. So, Michael, what else are you planning on doing with this? Are you going to take it with you eventually when you get a job? I'd I'd love to. Yeah, um, I guess you can do that. Right? I think that would be great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think there's a lot of different directions to go here. I think we're initially focused on looking at the role of the retrotransposon and mm -hmm. what are the mutations that were, were causing this, um, as well as some interesting ideas looking at, at the uh, evolution of the immune system and the immune response to this sort of thing. Uh, and if we can uh, find restriction factors that are, I'm not sure you'd call them restriction factors, or uh, polymorphic uh, genetic loci mm -hmm. that are involved in, in preventing engraftment by this uh, cancer in, in some yeah. populations or not others, and whether there's any uh, species-specific uh, restriction here. I think it could be a very interesting model in terms of investigating mm -hmm. uh, that kind of engraftment and how what are basal mechanisms in an animal where you don't have MHC, uh, what are the mechanisms that can prevent this sort of uh, transmission and this sort of oncogenesis? Yeah, I think that's a good approach because... You know, you can imagine it might be hard to pitch this as a project to get funded or to get a job based on. But if you pitch it like that, in terms of understanding immune system evolution, I think that's great. And that makes a lot of sense. I mean, this is a great example of how you have to just follow your curiosity, right? Yeah. Now we kept we kept you know getting sort of seduced <laughs> into this project yeah. mm -hmm. step yeah. by step. You know, and it's been a it's been a fun fun journey each that we first saw oh there's reverse transcriptase there must be something and we had an element retro element and then we had this huge expansion and then you know when you start looking deeper into it you get mm. this amazing surprise that it's actually transmitted yeah. as a clone there's a sign outside the hallway it says we are not the national institute of clam health now what did that come from <laughs> so, it came from carol reinish's um, interactions with the NIH when she was not getting funded uh -huh. and she was complaining how come and the NIH's response was well we're just not very interested in clams we're interested in humans you need to be working on a human disease but yeah I, I resist short -sighted, that right? <laughs> could reveal all about the human immune system because as you said mm -hmm. it's the evolution of it right yeah and I think it could be very interesting in terms of yeah, a model for understanding the evolution of the immune system as, as well as understanding how the sort of Hmm. basic oncogenic 
uh, mechanisms happen. Yeah. You know, and some of our friends know this. I mean, Irv Weissman is an example of a guy who's very interested in the primitive immune systems yeah. of, of, you know, uh, animals like this. Yeah, and he had identified some of the uh, histocompatibility uh, genes in uh, ascidians. Mm. Uh, these were the mm. uh, clonal tunicates that will have sort of fusion yeah. Uh, yeah. rejection events and... Well, you have to uh, be have open minds, you know. You can't. Th- that statement bugs me every time I see it because <laughs> it shows that they're not open minded. You just don't know. A lot of things could impinge on human health, right? You have to. I mean, no one would ever say when they started that restriction enzymes would impinge on human health. Mm-hmm. Yet <laughs> they made a whole biotechnology industry that can help, and CRISPRs are the same, right? Right. right. Absolutely. So who knows about clams, right? <laughs> it could be. So how much longer are you going to spend here, Michael? Uh, I do not know. That 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 depends on when I get a job somewhere else. You're looking so for a job now? Uh, yeah, I will be. Uh, well, now that year, you're on so. TWIV, you know, you're going to get hundreds of job offers. I, if I can get a TWIV bump, <laughs> I will definitely take it. <laughs> it's happened before. So you would like this. Have you started to put out feelers or you're not quite ready yet? Yeah, you've been here three years, right? Yeah, I've been here three years, so I'm definitely looking for the next uh, step there. Yeah, any places you'd rather go? You want to go back to Seattle? I, I would love the chance to go back to Seattle, but definitely. You should go somewhere where the steamers are nearby. Uh, they do have a steamer population out there, yeah, um, and they, uh, and that's actually an interesting population because, if we said it's it's been separated for about 200 right. years, so it'd be interesting to compare the genetics of of and the susceptibility of that population sure. to the ones on the East Coast. Well, if you found this um, steamer in them, then you knew that it, it, it was at least 200 years old, right? Right. If not older. Uh, and there's also another um, mussels out on the Pacific Coast yeah. that have a, a similar disease. And uh, that, based on some of the earlier evidence, it sounds like it may be uh, another case of a transmissible cancer in mm-hmm. that species as well. You're going to look at that? Yeah. Neat. Yeah, no, I think it's we have the tools now to look very easily at a number of these. So basically, we can look around at any leukemia, uh, you know, in a mollusk, and say pretty quickly, you know, whether this is the same, yeah, same right. kind of deal. Of course, the, it's still technically possible that the steamer has nothing to do with the tumor. You still have to. It's possible it is sort of a, a passenger mutation yeah, rather than yeah. a, a driver mutation. That's true, and it's. It, since there are 300 integration sites, we're not thinking that all 300 are sure. driving this thing. So it'll be interesting to, to look at the integration sites as well as the integration sites that are conserved because not all of the integration sites are present in every yeah. cancer. Uh, more than half of them are uh, in all of them. But there is some uh, either gain or loss in some of these populations as they've diverged, the populations of the, the cancer cells. So it'd be interesting to see what were sort of the the original mutations and, and see if they have a role. But as you said, it's possible that they are uh, passenger mutations that are more marking the tumor yeah. rather than... Well, if you found, it. let's say you found an integration next to an oncogene, what would what would you do to prove that that causes the tumor? Uh, to prove that that caused the tumor, you can look at uh, using methods to either overexpress that in a normal cell or knock right. it down knock in it the down. tumor cell. Right. Uh, yeah. So. And you said many of the um, amplifications, not all of them are maintained. So do they, they go away with time, right? Uh, so we have, we don't have longitudinal samples across yeah. the whole development of it. So we have uh, samples from Prince Edward Island and from Maine and, and New York. And uh, I've looked at a, a small number of integration sites. So I've looked at 12 integration sites picked from mm-hmm. animals from different locations. And uh, seven of them were definitively in all, all of those mm-hmm. populations. There were a couple that were present in only Prince Edward Island and not in New York and vice versa. There's a small number that were like that. So we don't know whether that's gain of, the, yeah, yeah. of a new integration site in one population, or it could be loss. Uh, I think in one case, we do know that there has been what appears to be a loss of a section of, of part of the genome in one of the populations. So we could be just losing whole chunks. Uh, uh, we don't know how stable this tumor is. <laughs> it's great. What a great story, right? Who would have known you would have done this? But I guess you have to keep your mind open, right? And 
It was an interesting <laughs> case because we we're actually we were looking for a virus. So yeah. this is Twib. Thank you for having us here, even though we, yeah, we didn't a find virus, a virus. Right. But it's not we a found virus. something else. I was going to say the entirely. only connection is that the retro transposons are precursors of mm. retroviruses. That's right. We, we feel like we're all in the same family. Retro right. retro transposons are the probably the you know in the same family as right. retroviruses. But you're not going to abandon it because it's a retro. Well, you like retro transposons sure. anyway. You always sure. go to the meeting every year, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> so, but after Michael leaves, you're going to do some aspect of it as well. That doesn't. Yeah, I think there's. I think there's so much to do. We're going to keep. I hope we're going to keep working on it. Yeah. Yeah. But this won't be the only thing you work on, right? No, it will not be still, the only thing we still work do on. HIV We're not going to abandon everything else. Other things, <laughs> yeah. No, that's great. Anything else I need to tell our listeners? Is that we covered it all, right? Uh, yeah, I think we covered. It's a great story. Quite a bit. And we covered that clams are still safe, <laughs> or the clams aren't safe. We're safe from. We're safe from the clams. <laughs> we're, the clams, well, the clams, aren't clams safe, might but... go away. They may die out, right? Well, I don't think we're going to wipe out the species. So it, it mm-hmm. looks like there's quite a few populations where. It's maintained at a low level, like um, lower one one percent, lower than five percent. So, it looks like there could be a situation where you have a large percentage of of susceptible animals killed, but then you could have animals that are not susceptible to engraftment. And so, so that, the study of them is very interesting too, right? Yeah, I think yeah. that is interesting. So, if you if you get a hundred clams from the shore, right, how many are going to have this amplification? Do you think? I uh, it's pretty variable. Um, yeah, so there are, there are beds where the prevalence is extremely high and mm. where they're dying, you know, right before your eyes. 50%, I think Carol says 90% huh. can be diseased. And then more common is Interesting. numbers like 10% diseased or, or 0% diseased. Can you, uh, so, you know, the, the Global Ocean Survey that Ventner did, you know, mm. he filtered. Can you look in that? Do you find steamer sequences? I haven't looked. Uh, I haven't mm-hmm. looked in that, but that would be actually very interesting to look. The, if the cells are floating around, he may have picked them up, right? It's That's true. true. He, I think he was in more tropical areas, well, he but did. He, he, went did, all around he the did world. go all over. So but yeah, I should definitely look at that, see if there are steamer sequences. Lots of in, different in areas. You know, he flew, he uh, sailed around the world in his boat, right? Right. <laughs> right. With That's a true. tube and, and sucking in water. <laughs> and just deep sequencing everything yeah, that comes Yeah, he filtered. He, he put it through a filter, okay. so a lot of viruses are gone, but uh, hemocytes should be... On the, the hemocytes would be captured if they yeah. got into the water. You just blast the whole data. Yeah, we should just. Yeah, I mean, it's true. Deep sequencing is sufficiently cheap, and you know, you could just take seawater and, and just yeah, deep sequence it. Yeah, you could do that. I mean, have. but he he has done something of that sort. I mean, I don't know how close he got to the shore, mm-hmm. right? Which is where the the, the yeah, soft these shells would be are, in right? The shore. He may have been more out at sea, but uh, it's worth looking at because it's just a a search, right? Yeah. But, but if not, you could yeah. go to the shore and collect some samples and look for the sequences. Mm-hmm. And you could see if in the clam beds where you have a higher prevalence of the disease, is there more, uh, or are there more cells floating in the water right? Uh, compared cool. to populations where you don't have it? So. Neat. Well, you're going to be doing some uh, of your own sampling. That'd be fun. Yeah, that'd All be great. Right. Well, guys, thanks for joining me. I want to thank my two guests today, We're both here at Columbia, Steve Goff, Thanks so much for coming back. Yeah, this is great. Appreciate it. Michael Metzger, thank you. Thank you for having me. It was a great story, and uh, I hope it keeps developing, and uh, good luck getting a job. Thank you. Yeah, all the uh, TWIVs are at iTunes and TWIV.TV. You can find them all free forever and ever, and if you have any questions or comments, uh, please send them to us. We love getting them. You can send them to TWIV at TWIV.TV. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.ws. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. <laughs> <laughs>